Uh, before we begin, please allow me to express our thanks to the Black & Decker Manufacturing Company for their support of our reception and uh, to retroactively thank them for their support of our reception also for Dr. Van Kampen of NATO, who was with us last Monday evening. Uh, the Black & Decker Corporation has been a corporate patron of this council since our founding in 1980, and we're indeed grateful to them for their continuing support. They've been represented on our board of trustees since that time, and of course, Mr. John Bruman, who is the vice chairman of their board of directors, uh, serves as chairman of the board of trustees of this council. Uh, we'll certainly miss Mr. Bruman when he returns, retires in January, and returns to his native England. Our schedule this afternoon, as you all know, is modified. Uh, uh, Dr. Crocker, as we mentioned, uh, will be joining the Secretary of State at 2 this afternoon, so our session here will end promptly at 12.55. Uh, our schedule will be, uh, as is usually the case, Dr. Croc uh, Crocker will speak for approximately 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period, which ends, as I say, promptly at 12.55. Uh, with uh, his uh, consent, I'll recognize the questioners, and uh, for him, uh, a mere formality, of course. In Dallas on September 17th, Dr. Crocker delivered an address which was entitled Africa, Economic Prospects and Problems Today. Problems. Uh, today in Baltimore, Dr. Crocker will deliver a significant address concerning Africa and security questions. The theme will be entitled The Challenge to Regional Security in Africa, the United States Response. As you all know, uh, the continent is in that slow process of emergence from colonialism and uh, moving uh, toward economic and political development. The instability of the continent is well known, its importance is also. The policy problems which are created for American policy uh, have been somewhat inhibited by uh, hesitancy to follow a practice of intervention, certainly. In any case, the external interests of uh, nations outside of that continent, its peculiar uh, aspects of instability, challenge the United States today. So that the theme of the U.S. response to regional security is certainly an appropriate and fundamental one. Dr. Crocker, as several of you know, is a graduate of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, earning his master's and Ph.D. degrees there. Uh, for the last 15 years, he has lectured, with, written widely, he has consulted with government agencies, with the private sector, with foundations, uh, in an uh, interestingly diverse manner. Uh, most recently, uh, prior to assuming his present position, he served as Director of African Studies at Georgetown's Center for Strategic and International Studies, in the time immediately prior to that, he was a member of the Georgetown faculty in several capacities uh, with an emphasis upon African politics and international relations. It's our great pleasure to welcome to Baltimore and to this council uh, to deliver a significant policy address the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Dr. Chester A. Crocker. Dr. Crocker. Dr. Byrd, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your generous welcome. I commend you for the formation and success of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Relations which is a singularly appropriate organization for our nation's third largest port city. I also commend those of you who had the wisdom to eat breakfast. <laughs> Baltimore is an international commercial hub that is symbolized <clears throat> in such a practical fashion by this impressive World Trade Center in which <clears throat> we have the pleasure of meeting today. I must add that I'm honored to have been invited by your council to participate in the speakers program that has succeeded in bringing so many distinguished leaders uh, to your forum. You in Baltimore do not have to be told about the economic interdependence of nations or about the need to expand trade links to the third world, 
which has been the main area for the expansion of American exports in recent years. Yet in considering today the security problems that are facing Africa, we are also discussing the interaction of political, economic, and security factors that comprise American interests in Africa. Security is one component of an equation. We too often consider our relations with the 50 nations of Africa in one of two highly simplistic ways. The globalists would have us believe that events in Africa are explainable as reactions to the initiatives and manipulations from key centers of world power. African goals, motives, and dynamics are, in this view, of only minor importance. Conversely, the regionalists stress the complex array of strictly African factors to explain events in the region. They suggest that the role of external power and external motivations is superficial, if not ephemeral. Both views are seriously flawed, and when pressed to extremes, potentially dangerous. Most African events are obviously explainable in local terms, and to ignore or be insensitive to these factors is folly. Yet it is equally true that the world is interdependent, and Africa is a full participant in the global economic and political system. Africa is directly influenced by, just as it also helps to shape, the competitive arena of world politics. Just to state that we have security interests in Africa is not to say that we seek to promote east-west confrontation there, which we do not. We have no mandate to be the gendarme of Africa, nor do we seek such a role. Certainly, we have no economic or political interests in Africa that are served by local arms races or by instability itself. On the contrary, our interests are best served by political and economic stability, which foster the peaceful development of modern African uh, economic and political institutions that can interact with our own to mutual advantage. Our overarching strategic goal in Africa is to help establish the rules of the game that will limit and discourage the application of outside force in African conflicts. This, there is a security challenge in Africa because there are real security threats to individual African nations and regions. Internal instability, often in tandem with external adventurism, plagues many African countries. Border struggles, which have often evolved from uncertain colonial arrangements, create serious regional problems. Ethnic rivalries have precipitated civil wars, sometimes leading to cross-border violence. The mere management of modest security forces overtax the meager resources of many states. These circumstances are often exploited by outside powers unfriendly to us, and in this manner, a problem having clearly African roots can acquire broader global implications. When this occurs, we face a new factor in the global balance which we cannot ignore. Neither we in the West nor African states can gain when one outside power seeks unilateral advantage through the projection or application of military force in Africa. Africa, like the West, is the loser when regional actors are encouraged to pursue violent rather than negotiated solutions. In such circumstances, we believe that unilateral self-denial by Western countries cannot strengthen African security or African non-alignment. Instead, it erodes the climate of confidence necessary to achieve them. The U.S. cannot be a credible partner if it ignores friendly African states who turn to us in real defensive need. The solutions to conflicts in Africa do not rest with U.S. abstinence while others rush in to exploit regional strife, and this administration stands ready to help bolster the security of countries so affected. The sobering fact is that it is not the West, but the Soviet Union, that has supplied Africa with some 60 to 70 percent of its imported arms. In 1981, the U.S. was in fifth place as a source of arms for Africa. Instead, we continue to emphasize economic over military assistance by a ratio of three to one. Next fiscal year, we plan over $1 billion of assistance, that is bilateral assistance, to sub-Saharan Africa. Of this, approximately $240 million is in the military sales and training field. This contrasts sharply with the Soviet bloc's overwhelming preponderance of military 
over economic assistance. Peaceful development is the only way that Africa will find solutions to critical social and economic challenges it faces. Africa is struggling to survive its worst economic crisis since World War II, and this explains our emphasis on economic assistance. We clearly recognize that even minimal conditions of security in Africa will be elusive unless African states can stabilize their economies and regain the path of development. But instability and insecurity frustrate this effort. When insecurity is fueled by outside forces, it is our job to help promote African interest in restoring stability. This is the key to an effective policy, the fact that Africans and we both seek peaceful change and the security needed for development and nation building. This is an essential element in our support for the Organization of African Unity, whose charter and foreign policy principles we endorse. The OAU is dedicated to protecting Africa's territorial integrity and defending the continent from external aggression and subversion. We give strong support to its mediation and peacekeeping activities within Africa, as do our allies. Let me give an example. Our cooperative efforts with the OAU have paid off. For example, U.S. policy toward Chad, aimed at countering Libyan military adventurism, has yielded important dividends over the past 12 months. In 1980, some 7,000 Libyan troops intervened in the Chadian civil war and quickly became a major source of regional instability, posing a direct threat along Sudan's borders and creating a great worry among other states bordering upon Chad. In late 1981, the then provisional Chadian government, headed by former President Gukuni, called upon Libya to remove its military force. Seriously concerned by the Libyan presence, we and others encouraged the Chadians to ask for Libya's withdrawal and to seek the OAU's help in solving the internal problems of that country. We then worked closely with the OAU to prepare the way for an African peacekeeping force to maintain order in Chad once the Libyans left. An African peacekeeping force organized by the OAU chairman, Kenya's president, Daniel Arab Moy, was subsequently deployed into Chad in record time before serious factional violence could break out in the void left behind by the Libyans. This remarkable achievement reflects favorably on Chairman Moy and the troop donor countries for that OAU effort, Nigeria, Zaire, and Senegal. For our part, the United States moved directly to facilitate and support this peacekeeping effort. We allocated some $12 million to support the Nigerian and Zairean contingents with non-lethal equipment and aid to transport of supplies to Chad. We also supported OAU efforts to promote reconciliation among the various Chadian factions. By June of 1982, President Gupuni, who had refused reconciliation efforts proposed by the OAU, had been forced out of Chad and replaced by his principal rival, Hassan Habre. For the past four months, President Habre has consolidated his control over the entire country and actively pursued the goal of internal political reconciliation. The OAU therefore concluded that its troops could be withdrawn. The U.S. has been responding to the urgent humanitarian needs in Chad with emergency food shipments, air transport food to hard-hit areas in rural Chad and provision of emergency assistance. Chad's problems are far from over. Libya still occupies a band of territory which it claims across the north of the country and seems prepared to support insurrection again. Chad's reconstruction and reconciliation must proceed apace if Libya is to be denied another opportunity for foreign meddling in this sensitive area. Recognizing this, the U.S. has just signed an agreement to provide $2.8 billion in rehabilitation assistance to Chad over the coming year. We will also be supporting an international donors conference, which the UN and the OAU are organizing to get urgently needed economic assistance flowing. The initial international response to Chad's plight has been hardening, particularly the massive international food airlift, which took place in September, and certainly was responsible for saving hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. Perhaps nowhere in Africa have our security concerns and our security policies been more intensely engaged than in Southern Africa. 
This region, from Zaire to the Cape, contains the bulk of Africa's mineral wealth, its most developed industrial structures, and almost two-thirds of the continent's GNP. It is also a region threatened with a prospect of heightened violence and polarization that could lead to great power confrontation. It is precisely to avoid that possibility of violence and confrontation that we have fashioned a major effort to bring about regional peace and security. Southern Africa is a complex region, and its many characteristics and conflicts cannot be easily summarized. But two major sources of tension dominate the scene. One is that South Africa, the richest and most powerful state in the region, governed by a white minority that has erected a structure of legally entrenched racial separation to protect itself, feels surrounded and threatened by its black ruled neighbors. South Africa believes that it must preempt any armed threat, guerrilla or conventional, from its neighbors and is prepared to use its military superiority to that end. Until there develops a structure of understanding, some reciprocally understood basis for coexistence <coughs> between South Africa and its neighbors, this situation will remain a major source of instability that could result in growing violence across borders. To say this is not to downplay the urgency or the gravity of South Africa's own domestic agenda. Movement toward a system based on consent, shaped by South Africans of all races, is essential for that country's stability and survival. But that process is unlikely to occur peacefully in conditions of heightened international violence across South Africa's borders. The second great source of tension came with the collapse of the Portuguese Empire in Southern Africa in 1974-75 and the decision of the USSR to inject its power into the vacuum that resulted. Soviet arms had been fed to its surgeon movements in this part of Africa for many years, but in 1975 the USSR supported the deployment of 25,000 Cuban troops to Angola. This direct interjection of Soviet and proxy military power into southern Africa posed a challenge to the future of the region. It exacerbated South Africa's feelings of threat from its neighbors. It added threats to long-term Western access to the region's minerals and economic resources. Without question, it raised to a new threshold the tension between South Africa and its neighbors, and it affected the calculations of all who live in this region. It is not overstatement to note that the political future of Africa will be shaped by the ways in which the deep tensions and problems of Southern Africa are eventually resolved. It is for these reasons that this administration has adopted a policy of constructive engagement in Southern Africa. The search for a more stable, secure, and prosperous Southern Africa will be a long and arduous process, but there is no other responsible course for American policy. There are many aspects to this effort, but we judged that the place to start was with the interrelated conflicts in Namibia and Angola. A year ago, we were in the initial stages of the revived negotiations toward Namibian independence based on UN Security Council Resolution 435. Working closely with our Western Five contact group partners, that's France, Germany, Canada, and Britain, and the other parties to the negotiations, we have come a long way since that time. On July 12, we were able to conclude phase one of these negotiations, agreement to a set of principles concerning the Constituent Assembly and the Constitution for an independent Namibia. Since then, we have also made considerable progress on other remaining questions, including the need for the impartiality of all parties during the UN supervised elections and the size, deployment, and composition of UNTAG, that is, the UN Transitional Assistance Group, which would be responsible for monitoring uh, the plan for Namibian independence under Resolution 435. With the exception of the electoral system for the Constituent Assembly and final agreement on the composition of battalions to serve in UNTAG, we are close to the implementation uh, of the UN plan. At the same time, we have always made clear that there is also a vitally important Angolan agenda which must be addressed. Seven years after Angola's independence from Portugal, thousands of Cuban combat forces and a substantial number 
of Soviet advisors remain in that country as participants in a tragic and prolonged civil war. The presence of these forces has, since their introduction in 1975, profoundly affected the regional balance. From the outset, we recognize that Namibia does not exist in a vacuum, and that in practice, the chances for a negotiated settlement <coughs> would be decisively influenced by parallel progress uh, toward the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola. This is not an issue which we contrived on our own. The South African government, which all parties agree holds the key to a settlement, has long made clear its deep concern over the presence of these forces. It would, of course, be idle to argue that the U.S. has no interest of its own in ending the presence of Cuban troops in Southern Africa. The introduction of Cuban combat forces into Angola changed strategic reality and upset the delicate fabric of reciprocal restraint maintained since World War II in the developing world. It was the first of a series of events all of us know too well that led us to the period of aggravated tension we face with the Soviet Union today. Regaining that balance, regaining that restraint, is in Africa's interest, our interest, and in the interests of a more stable and positive U.S.-Soviet relationship as well. We have, for nearly a year now, been engaged in an intensive, high-level dialogue with the Angolan government in an effort to reach a broadly acceptable formula for Cuban troop withdrawal. These bilateral discussions have been held outside the framework of Security Council Resolution 435, and are not part of the mandate of the Western Five Contact. We believe that we have achieved real progress in our talks with the Angolans. We will spare no effort in continuing our quest for a comprehensive, peaceful settlement in the region. However, this complicated and difficult effort involves fundamental issues and choices for both sides, and it will take time. In the final analysis, there will be no agreement unless the security concerns of the principal parties are dealt with. We have sought and will continue to seek an understanding that meets the basic concerns of all parties and opens a new and brighter chapter in Southern Africa's troubled history. East Africa and the adjacent Indian Ocean area represents another region which is of major concern to the U.S. in global security terms. The states in this region realize that their first priority is to overcome serious economic problems that hobble development and interfere with productive political relations. The U.S. and other Western countries, together with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and other international financial institutions, are currently working with countries in East Africa to overcome their severe economic difficulties. We consider that this effort, which will require painful reforms by the countries themselves and extraordinary steps by creditor countries is an essential aspect of our effort to address Africa's security problems. Serious political problems also exist in the region, however, and these cause instability and unrest. Last summer, we witnessed attempted coups in Kenya and the Seychelles and major clashes between Ethiopia and Somalia. In Uganda, years will be needed to overcome the consequences of former President Idi Amin's tyranny. Ethiopia, second only in Africa to Nigeria in population, is still in the throes of insurgency and civil war in parts of its territory. These local problems are especially troublesome because the region's considerable strategic significance to the West. East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula lie astride the Red Sea in the major oil tanker lanes leading to Europe. Fortunately, a good number of our allies and our Arab friends in the Middle East are prepared to assist in addressing these concerns and these issues. For example, the French naval presence in the Indian Ocean and the French military assistance to the Republic of Djibouti complement our own efforts in the region. European and Arab economic assistance to East Africa is also significant, and I might say it's often larger than our own. An important example of the regional security concern we face in this part of Africa is the Horn of Africa itself. Tensions within this strategically important part of the continent, an area astride key transport routes, go back at least to the 19th century. These tensions are sustained by foreign intervention 
domestic civil strife, and ethnic irredentism that pose a grave challenge to the African structure of order which is enshrined in the charter of the Organization of African Unity. In recent years, this source of tension has sparked major outside involvement. Somalia, in 1977, attacked Ethiopia in an effort to take over the Ogaden region. Ethiopia, in turn, called upon Moscow and Cuba for assistance. Today, some 11,000 Cuban troops remain in Ethiopia, and the USSR has established a position of influence in Ethiopia through massive arms shipments totaling around $4 billion in five years. In return, the USSR has acquired naval and air facilities in Ethiopia itself. The U.S. has an important interest in this region. Following upon the revolution in Iran and the threat to oil supplies in the Middle East, the U.S. entered into a series of agreements with countries in Africa and the Middle East for the use of facilities to support our rapid deployment force. Somalia is one of those countries. At the same time, the U.S. has consistently supported the OAU position on the sanctity of colonial boundaries and has limited our military assistance to Somalia to quite modest levels geared to the defense of internationally recognized Somali territory. But security in this region is now threatened from the Ethiopian side. With the massive shipments of Soviet arms and a major expansion of its military forces, Ethiopia now has the largest standing army in sub-Saharan Africa and is far superior to Somalia in numbers and weapons. In 1981, Ethiopia signed a treaty with Libya and South Yemen, which has led to Libyan-Ethiopian cooperation in subversion and armed attack against both Sudan and Somalia. This past summer, Ethiopian regular troops, supporting a smaller number of Somali dissidents trained and armed in Ethiopia, occupied several Somali towns. Evidence indicates that Ethiopian actions are intended to foster instability and insurrection in Somalia and to overthrow the Somali government. African security is not served if Soviet arms, Cuban reserve forces, and Libyan money and arms are combined to overthrow legitimate governments in the Horn of Africa. The U.S. has acted quickly in this situation. We have airlifted several shipments of arms to Somalia and indicated that we are not prepared to countenance subversive action and armed aggression against our friends in the region. Our action, together with Somali nationalist sentiment against the Ethiopian attacks, has served to strengthen Somalia in this crisis, though several areas remain occupied by Ethiopian forces. We are at the same time looking at a wider basis for resolution of the tensions in this region. We have no intention or desire to refuel Somali ambitions against Ethiopia, nor do we wish to see Somalia and Sudan have to allocate greater resources to defense when their economic needs are so great. We are making clear to all the parties in this region that we are interested in promoting a modus vivendi among them and are doing everything within our power to encourage better relations among those countries with whom we do have close ties, such as Somalia and Kenya. We would welcome signs from Ethiopia that it too seeks a better structure for relationships in the region and an end the policies of confrontation. As a clear indication of where we think priorities should be placed, during this same period, we have been actively engaged with our allies in Europe and with the international financial institutions to promote more comprehensive economic assistance programs for Sudan, Kenya, and Somalia. In summary, we have provided a limited but important and timely military assistance program to a, a serious security threat in this region. We will not shrink from helping our friends, nor from defending our own strategic interests. But our policy objectives are broader. We are not building up threatening forces. We are giving our full weight to the accepted African position on international boundaries, and are making ourselves available for diplomatic efforts that can reduce the security threats in this area. In West Africa as well, the U.S. has important political and security interests to protect. Most countries in this region are moderate in outlook and Western oriented. They comprise a large block of votes in the UN and other international bodies. Their views are important factors in reaching an African and OAU consensus 
on issues of great importance to Africa and the West. Additionally, our strategic interests include access to petroleum. Nigeria is our second largest foreign supplier of oil, second only to Saudi Arabia. But these countries are facing severe economic problems which can result in political instability and outside adventurism, as well as the loss to the West of some supportive and moderate friends. In Ghana, for example, a deteriorating economic situation eroded support for a weak but pro-Western democratic government and led directly to its downfall. In Liberia, rampant corruption and an economic crisis led to a military coup in 1980. As one of its earliest acts, the Reagan administration developed a program of sustained support for the new government to enable it to resist the blandishments of the Soviets and their surrogates, which were designed to destroy the special relationship which has existed between Liberia and the U.S. for some 150 years. Our assistance, primarily economic but including military loan credits, has increased tenfold during the last four years. Other Western African nations confront real and serious external security threats, notably those emanating from Libya. As neighbors of Colonel Gaddafi, several West African countries have suffered his adventurism and destabilizing efforts. For example, Gaddafi has publicly threatened the moderate government of Niger as his next target for subversion. Similarly, his government is engaged in the training of dissidents who were helped to return to their home countries and to work against established governments there. The U.S. has been responsive to requests for help against such threats. In Niger, we've established a modest foreign military sales program and a military training program. We have also asked the Congress to approve a small balance of payments grant to help Niger meet its budget shortfall stemming from the collapse and growth uranium market prices. All these U.S. security programs in Sub-Saharan Africa are in support of our strategic goal, the one I mentioned earlier, of helping to establish and maintain the limits of outside force that is applied in Africa. We are not Africa's self-appointed police, but we are its partner in economic growth and nation building. As such, we cannot ignore the real security threats facing our African partners, especially when these are prompted or fueled by our global adversaries. Moreover, the presence of Soviet bloc forces and bases in parts of Africa that would threaten our communications with the Middle East and the Gulf are a serious challenge to vital U.S. security interests. The answer is neither to ignore the problem nor to overreact and provoke an essentially east-west arms race. The proper answer is for the U.S. and our allies in close consultation with our African friends to provide just the amount of security assistance to afflicted African nations for them and us to achieve mutual strategic goals. We Americans, especially in leading commercial centers such as this, have become increasingly sophisticated in our appreciation of our major stake in the economic success of Africa and the rest of the third world. We know that we cannot afford unlimited amounts of economic assistance to countries unable to support themselves. We know that we need a number of commodities that only they can provide in abundance and that our future prosperity, ours, depends in large part on the growth of their economies. That is why the Reagan administration believes it is equally important for all of us to understand the critical role that security considerations play in the economic development equation. It is a challenge that we and our African friends must meet and overcome. Thank you very much. is either in nuclear power already or on the verge of being in nuclear power at the time of the Soviet choosing. Now when, even in this present state, is an overwhelmingly strong military power in the region in which it is situated. We also have recently recognized in America that our capacity to influence events in those parts of the world where one nation has an overwhelming military power is limited. How does the American State Department propose to deal with in the long strategic way? Oh. 
Well, I'm not going to comment on guesstimates about South Africa's nuclear status as a potential uh, nuclear power in the military sense, but I, I think my remarks uh, would indicate that we, uh, we agree fully about the analysis that, uh, that South Africa's position is militarily, in physical terms, uh, one of obvious superiority vis-a-vis um, -vis its immediate neighbors. Uh, now, no one is saying that that means that, that guns can maintain uh, stability, guns alone. But it is clearly a situation in which if there is not, if there does not develop uh, some tacitly, if not overtly agreed ground rules between South Africa and its immediate neighbors, and some of these ground rules already exist, that we're going to see expanded violence in both directions. We're going to see cross-border violence in both directions. Violence which is inimical to our interests, uh, as I've tried to indicate. So. We believe that it is our role to engage ourselves in the search for the elaboration of such understood uh, structures or rules or tacit understanding. Um, that's an ambitious undertaking. We have started this process uh, through our very uh, sustained diplomacy on Namibia and Angola. That is a logical starting place. Uh, there is a great deal of international attention and concern focused on the Namibia issue. We would not be able to begin this effort if we were not to address uh, Namibia uh, as amongst our earliest priorities. But if we're successful there, and I underscore, if we are successful there, it could have broader implications uh, for the region, Southern Africa as a whole. Yes. The motor is preventing we hope for in the Horn of Africa. Is it realistic to hope that that might include movement of the hundreds of thousands of refugees from the Agana into Somali back into their native territory? And is, it, is that within the foreseeable future? Well, all sorts of things are in the uh, potentially foreseeable future. I certainly don't think it's imminent, no. Uh, there are, as you've indicated, thousands and thousands of refugees uh, in Somalia. <coughs> uh, while they are welcome, because they are ethnic Somalis, and because African countries in general have a tradition of welcoming refugees that is uh, without equal in the world, uh, they are an enormous burden to Somalia. And one hopes that there will come a time when they can return to the places they came from. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to pretend that we have an imminent uh, grand design or settlement plan for the Horn of Africa that has uh, eluded Westerners and others for many, many years. But we do believe that there must, uh, there must be progress towards a de-escalation of the military aspects of tension as between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, and we're prepared to make, as I said, make ourselves available in seeking uh, such, such a role as we've been. Professor Lemus Smith. Secretary Crocker, some of us get a bit of a Skeptical uh, when we see how U.S. relates to Boeing. Not long ago, somebody was describing Britain as a toothless bulldog. Uh, this was in connection with Namibia, with um, um, Zimbabwe. And I think that Boeing is no doubt a toothless bulldog. And I think that. Um, uh, it's very generous if one says that, that, uh, that it's uh, a waste of time uh, dealing with Boeing. Um, the problem is Africa. I think uh, we are going to be fair. But um, I doubt very much that the US has in fact understood what the real problems in Africa are. Um, in spite of your introductory remarks, your speech that comes back to the very early uh, globalist, regionalist, localist um, distinctions without written. Um, um, I think that what the U.S. has to start thinking on is helping Africans to build within their own countries those kinds of institutions that will make Africans strong. Like jumping in with $12 billion is not, it's just a suggestion in the context of the world. US um, uh, efforts. Um, uh, what we 
you have to understand is that Britain went away, Portugal went away, France went away. We have to go in the institutions that will strengthen the country so they can stand up against the Gaddafis and the Soviets. Also, we have to, to see that uh, there's a lot going on uh, within these African countries, the financial Gaddafis, that before we know, we, uh, within a very short time, we have the whole of West Africa turning gray. And um, I don't think that um, America will be happy that time. We don't have to wait for that to happen before we jump into the arms. Just the comment out there. Do you want to crystallize that in question? Or? No, just a comment. I try, try if you would to, we only have a few moments to make your questions as succinct as possible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, toward the end, you said uh, that our policy is to assist our friends especially when it is prompted and fueled by our global adversary. Now that concerns me a great deal. The uh, uh, man from Kenya, Ambassador from Kenya, mentioned some of the things that were about Europe, some of that. Why do we wait? And why are we, why is our, our, our policy dependent on uh, our adversary rather than our own Projected, uh, uh, I think there is a little something in common between these two comments, and maybe I can just say something briefly. Um, I stress repeatedly in my remarks that we do not believe that our response to Africa problems should be or is primarily military. It's overwhelmingly economic, it's overwhelmingly technical assistance food assistance, refugee assistance, institution building assistance, and all the things that our friend was, was just talking about. That still is where the great bulk of our effort is, and that's where it should be. And that goes on day in and day out, and this country can be bloody proud of its record in supporting African development. We account bilaterally and multilaterally for something between 25 and 30 percent of all resource flows in the continent of Africa. Our global adversary counts for 1% of the economic aid going to Africa. And that also is not surprising. Um, but when it comes to situations in which there is a local conflict, which then becomes internationalized because the Soviets or their surrogates step in, it acquires a different dimension for the reasons that I indicated. We do not believe that we should permit the precedent to be established, that outsiders have the right to shape and determine the outcome of Africa. And we do not believe that the president should be established that conflicts can be pursued successfully through military means. And in that respect, I think what we're saying is fundamentally consistent uh, with the interest of Africans as they themselves define it. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any truth to the fact that a $1.1 billion loan coming from the international monetary fund is being supported by? Uh, there is an IMF loan uh, agreement that has recently uh, been negotiated between the IMF and South Africa. Uh, it is not the United States to approve it or disapprove it, but the fact is that the IMF board will formally approve it in the very near future. And uh, we certainly pose no objection to it. It has been judged on its economic and financial merits, and that is the basis on which all our decisions should be made. Uh, that's, that's been our position. And any government uh, which succeeds uh, in negotiating such terms with the IMF uh, is looked at basically on the grounds of its economic program, the facts, the economic and financial facts that are put before the IMF. The IMF is not a political institution. So that's the position that we have, that we have taken. We've not been asked to accept or reject it. Yes. I'm wondering, could you uh, specify for us some of the policies and programs taken by this administration that are against our partner? We have uh, done a number of things in that arena, which I think um, I would want to identify very briefly given the time constraint. I was recently a uh, party in a discussion of this time, a speaker series in which a distinguished South African parliamentarian was asked the question, 
isn't your, as a matter of fact, the leader of the opposition in South Africa, isn't it true that this administration has decided to support the, the government of South Africa? And hasn't that made your life uh, more difficult? And the answer he gave is the leader of the opposition in South Africa uh, was rather interesting. He said, no, on the contrary, I think that what this administration has done is to complicate the minds of the government enormously. Because it is what we have tried to do is to offer a conditional hand of friendship. If South Africa moves as its government says it wants to move, away from the party, towards a better future, towards a future which is fairer, ultimately towards a, a future based on consent and broadened participation, it's our job to help. Uh, so I think that uh, that very basic political signal has been one thing that we have done. And it's one thing that we attach enormous importance to, to indicate that if there is a certain kind of change, recognizing that change will be inevitably step by step, not all at once. It's our responsibility to recognize it uh, and, and to support that general movement. It is not our responsibility to endorse blueprints or solutions for South Africans to come up with their own solutions. And that must be a process which includes all South Africans. Secondly, what we've done is to, to uh, indicate in very clear terms that we do not believe that pulling the plug on the South African economy through disinvestment is going to help erode apartheid. The consequences of American disinvestment are utterly incalculable. But the one thing you can feel pretty certain about, I think, is that it will not advance black advancement in the job sector, in the workplace, or anyplace else. So we have said that constructive engagement means that our society our economy, our businesses ought to be involved in South Africa under conditions of decent corporate good citizenship. Another example we put, uh, as I'm sure you know, we put uh, funding from the Congress with bipartisan support into an expanded program of support for black education. Uh, these are uh, among the things that, that have been done, and we do what we can. Yes. I'm not certain I have the number that I can give you on top of my head on the number of what we call INET programs. These are, in many cases, uh, very modest programs involving training courses for two or three or four African officers who may come to this country to go into our training institutions. Dollar for dollar, the IMET program, which in Africa totaled something less than six million dollars last year, is probably the most important program of assistance we have in terms of the access that it gives us to people who are going to be of very great importance in African institutions in the future, uh, in terms of opening up horizons on both sides. Uh, but I would guess, to answer your question, that we probably have IMET programs in 60 to 70 percent of African countries. Most of these programs, less than $100,000, training courses, essentially. We have military sales programs under creditor grant terms in much fewer countries, much fewer countries. We have time for uh, one question, which is clever enough to demand a short answer. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure it's terribly clever, but you stated that the IMF is supposed to be non-political and apolitical. And yet, you've seen that the U.S. has been very instrumental in it. For example, having loans to Vietnam, The other side of the IMF staff uh, voted and decided that we be not invested this to go to El Salvador because it was very heavy and leaning to make them go through. So it seems that we do take a moral stand, why this gets a con. Moral stands are one thing. I mean, I don't think you can really use the Vietnam as a case in point. Vietnam is not a member, to my knowledge, of these institutions. That's something that's changed recently. But in any event, I do think there is a an important distinction between working uh, with countries with, 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 with which you have channels open. We do have many channels of communication, an amazing number with South Africa, uh, private, governmental, uh, non-governmental, and so on. Uh, 
we do feel that we get many important signals across uh, about how we feel, what we would like to see uh, toward, toward that country. In, in the case of a country which is a totally closed system or one which is clearly going in a certain path, there may not be much limit, much other alternative, but to indicate uh, your view through the way you may uh, try to influence a lending program. But it is not, in general, the policy of this government to politicize the IMF. And I think you'll find very few examples of that. Well, it's certainly been good of you to take time out. of course, has taken time off from a very busy day and, and from the discharge of his heavy responsibilities. I think he's been more than generous with his time. And certainly, your answers to questions have been most helpful. Um, for the benefit of those of you who are uh, have adjusted to our change of schedule, our, our bar will be open for about five minutes while uh, uh, lunch is served. Again, Mr. Secretary, we thank you very much.